all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubry, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes & Co. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4pm until 6pm as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, welcome. I am Bev Turner here for the next hour. It is a sunny start to a long weekend of lamb roasting, chocolate eating, and if you're lucky, visiting friends and family. But as we're going to hear from my Brainiac panel tonight, millions of Brits are going to be frustrated by cancelled flights, horrific traffic jams, and those three dreaded words, rail replacement service. Are you amongst the stranded? If so, I'd love to know who you hold responsible. Plus, could Elon Musk be the savior of free speech on Twitter? Does our response to the Ukraine conflict and our willingness to offer up our spare rooms highlight inherent racial bias? And ladies, how do you feel about the non-binary kid insisting that we don't need women-only changing rooms? I think they are wrong. It's all coming up, but first, the news headlines. Good evening, it's 6.01. I'm Miranda Shunker in the GB Newsroom. A senior US official says his sunken Russian warship was hit by two Ukrainian missiles. They added the Neptune anti-ship missile strike on the Moskva resulted in Russian casualties. The Kremlin claims the Soviet-era vessel sank in stormy seas after an explosion of onboard ammunition. Former British Army officer Stuart Crawford told GB News the loss of the warship is significant. But however it happened, it is a major blow uh, for prestige and, and these things resonate through population. It will be a morale boost for um, Ukraine. I think uh, we in the West have just got to uh, keep pressing to deliver the sort of weapons that they need to defend their territory and also eventually to take back territory which has been lost. The UN's refugee agency says UK proposals to send asylum seekers to Rwanda for processing are illegal. Downing Street says migrants who arrive in the UK illegally could be sent to the East African country within six weeks. The Prime Minister hopes the £120 million deal will serve as a considerable deterrent to migrants attempting to cross the channel. But immigration lawyer Harjap Singh Bangal says the scheme is expensive and unworkable. Last year, Australia processed 249 people offshore. It cost them £461 million, pounds, so UK pounds. If we're thinking, and the expectations are now in the eyes of the British public, oh, this is great, there's going to be 20,000 people sent to Rwanda, their figures just don't make sense at all. £120 million isn't going to cut it. Well, more than 150 people have been injured in clashes inside Jerusalem's most holy site. Israel says it's arrested hundreds of Palestinians after rocks and fireworks were thrown at police at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, also known as Temple Mount. Security forces are on high alert after a series of deadly Arab street attacks in the last fortnight. 
Residents in Shanghai have clashed with police over new coronavirus policies. It's being reported residents have protested after being told to immediately leave their apartment building so the government can use it as a COVID isolation facility. Footage shows people kneeling and even lying down in front of police wearing hazmat suits, with some being dragged away. Latest figures show there are 23,000 infections in Shanghai. Several oil firms have secured court injunctions to try to stop protesters blockading fuel processing sites in the UK. It's as dozens of Just Stop oil protesters were charged after three oil terminals were blocked today. The government says it's pleased to see oil companies taking action to secure the normal delivery of fuel. But Paul Sheiky from Just Stop Oil says they have no choice but to continue demonstrating. A man has been charged after the bodies of two people were found at separate addresses in Scotland. The body of 51-year-old Paul Duffy was discovered on Sunday in Coatbridge, North Lanarkshire. Officers also found the body of 26-year-old Emma Bailey in a nearby property two days later. A 46-year-old man will appear in connection with the deaths at Airdrie Sheriff Court tomorrow. England's Test cricket captain Joe Root says stepping down from the role is the most challenging decision of his career. Root holds the record for the highest number of Test match wins as captain since he took on the role in 2017. But he's chosen to leave after two series defeats against the West Indies last month and Australia in the winter. Vice captain Ben Stokes has paid tribute though, saying Root has been a privilege to play with. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex have made their first public appearance in Europe since quitting as senior working royals more than two years ago. Harry and Meghan arrived at the Invictus Games in the Netherlands after stopping off in the UK for a surprise visit to the Queen and the Prince of Wales. The couple's brief trip to the UK came after they were absent from the Duke of Edinburgh's memorial service in London last month. And the UK has recorded its hottest day of the year so far. As temperatures reached 22 degrees in some places, that's 71.6 Fahrenheit. St James's Park in central London was the hottest location in the country. But it wasn't limited to the south, with Yorkshire and parts of Scotland also seeing high temperatures. The Met Office has urged people to wear sunscreen to protect against higher than normal UV levels. Well, on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now let's get back to Bev Turner. Hello again. It is good to be back while Michelle takes a well-earned break. And I'm delighted to introduce tonight's intellectual heavyweights for you. They're going to be helping me. Uh, why are you laughing? It's true. Uh, to tackle the stories of the day. Uh, Alex Dean, PR consultant, is here. Frank Faridi, author and academic. And Nabila Ramdani, journalist and broadcaster. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us this evening. I also want to know uh, your thoughts. Get in touch with me, gbviews at gbnews.uk or on Twitter at GB News or my own account, which is at Beverly Turner. And can I also remind you to subscribe to our YouTube page. You can watch live or see the best bits from the channel when you search GB News. Now, Easter weekend is here. We should be chilling out, shouldn't we? Visiting family and trying to stop the kids eating too much chocolate. But instead, Britain will be trapped in gridlock, unable to travel by train, queuing at airports, and sitting bumper to bumper on the ironically named smart motorways. It's all so predictable and infuriating. If you're affected by the chaos, do let me know this evening. I would love to know how you're getting on. Vent your frustration with us here, won't you, uh, at GB News on Twitter. Uh, didn't we have months to fix this mess? Why, I've been thinking all day, when everyone was working from home, didn't anyone take the opportunity to upgrade our woefully inadequate rail network and do all of the work that clearly uh, does need to be done? Now, Frank, coming to you first. You've had to change your plans this weekend, haven't you, because of all the disruption? I did. Uh, living in Kent, which is like the worst part of the country, uh, where you have diversions everywhere, it began yesterday by coming back from my gym. Usually it takes five minutes to get from the gym to home. It's a 45-minute journey. 
On the train and in the car, in the car. car, because the road were, were clogged up because the police were stopping trucks and lorries on the grounds that they had to re redivert them because of the problems in Dover. Mm. So that was the beginning. Then I get a phone call from uh, some people who I invited for Sunday lunch tomorrow, and they said that they've just given up, you know, because uh, the trains were get slow and uh, it was beautiful outside. They didn't want to spend their life indoors in a yeah. train station or, or hoping that the train gets there in time. Or on the bus, or, which or, would replace on, the or, rail. Or on the bus. But then, then I'm coming here to the studio, and I give myself an extra hour to come down from Kent. Uh, so the train is really slow. Uh, at, at this point, I, I, I decide I'm going to drive, because if I drive to Epsfleet Station, it'll be all right, because then it's, it's a short journey. So mm. I get to Epsfleet, I get to London. You get on the Metropolitan Line, and it's, trains are canceled. Then finally, I'm told to go to Baker Street, and there I have to wait 15 minutes for the next train, by which time the clock is mm. ticking. And at this point, despite my age and my physical deterioration, I started running <laughs> to get here on <laughs> That's time. That's going to the gym, does that for you, Frank? <laughs> so it worked in the end. But it, it, to me, it, I mean, this, this is just ridiculous. And if there's one positive thing I would suggest to our government, why don't you nationalize piano? Mm for six months, nine months, or, or 12 months. Get that sorted out. Piano. Piano in particular. Why don't you take seriously what's happening in the ports in Kent uh, and to make sure that we don't have shortages, you know, sort of all kinds of stuff, the lawyers are able to get by, and that people can enjoy this summer. Well, you, ha you have faith that the government will run it better than the private business, maybe, in a way that I wouldn't necessarily have. Only for six months. Ooh, I think, isn't the problem, though, Alex, that it's, you know, when you say for six months, in a sense, some of these uh, institutes, some of these sort of, uh, our transport network, they are literally like, it is, the, they are behemoths, that nothing changes quickly, I get that. But, Alex, what can we do? Because there are, there are going to be thousands of people who are listening to this today, who are millions, millions of people, um, who are listening on the radio or is sat in their car, they're watching at home, and they share our frustrations this evening, don't they? Sure. Do we just get used to it, Alex? Is this just what Great well, Britain is? We've been used to it for a long time. And, and I think the, the difference, the inflection point, is what you've pointed out, that we had an opportunity over a period of months, two years of, uh, of periodic lockdowns to try to address it. There is something different about the situation now, though, which is that our working patterns have changed. The traditional excuse for making a hash of weekends like this one, the long weekend over Easter, is that passenger numbers are lower. But I'm sure that we'll see over the coming year, because people aren't working on Mondays and Fridays in the same way, we could be far more imaginative about the way that we do these upgrades. And it, I know that it may take uh, more than a day sometimes, and you may need to take bite into a weekend. But heaven's sake, up and down the country, rail replacement bus services every time. That's got to be avoided. That's the nightmare. And by the way, they don't give you a discount or a rebate, do they? You've paid for the train, but you get the bus service. Yeah. You don't get a penny back. No. Nabila, do we just... How do we how do we cope with this? Because I think what Alex is saying, I agree with it. We've got these very there's many more of us working from home now. There isn't the same presenteeism in an office. Should we therefore on when normally works are scheduled on the bank holiday weekend? Because I I presume the logic is well, it's more important than you make that you make money than see your family. <laughs> the last two years has really kind of thrown that up in the air and fallen in all sorts of different shapes. What do we do now? And whose responsibility is it? Well, to be fair, I don't think anybody can prevent travel chaos nowadays, not least of all in a, a relatively small country like, like Britain. And we often forget that moving around in massive numbers uh, is due to new advances in transportation and indeed communications. And airfares, for example, have reached rock, rock bottom uh, prices and it's far easier to book um, air, air, air travel tickets, for example. I think what has happened is that huge sections of society have um, lost their freedom during the uh, pandemic uh, lockdowns, and they are now all at once uh, there are millions of them who want to take advantage of uh, travel restrictions mm. being swept uh, but that, away. But that's not a surprise, though, is it? Like I think it draws, uh, more crucially, draws attention to fault lines in uh, the infrastructure of, of transport and, and indeed to the inherent difficulty 
difficulties of processing millions of people. Um, I mean, there are evidently sh uh, staff shortages, um, which is a huge problem for airlines mm -hmm. and for those who are running airports and other transport uh, hubs uh, in general. And just because travel restrictions have now uh, been uh, uh, largely swept away, it doesn't mean that security has uh, gone away. And for example, we're hearing that airlines are saying that it takes up to six months, for example, to vet new security uh, screening staff who are desperately needed needed uh, following uh, the pandemic. So it's almost like the whole travel industry has been hibernating and now it's waking up to uh, a huge demands that they have to respond to yeah, in well, a few months. I don't think we need to be fatalistic about it because it seems to me that we've got the wherewithal to do something. So for example, the argument was that if we, if we use railways a lot, then that will take the pressure off the roads. What happens is that the railway system doesn't improve and that's one of the easiest systems to sort out with a little bit of investment. You have a situation where the, uh, the in existing infrastructure is just remain, remaining the same. You have a situation where in many other countries, night work on infrastructure is quite normal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, people work at night because then it doesn't really disrupt the you know, travel on the roads and elsewhere. Seems to me that you know our infrastructure goes to sleep at night. Well, well, network rail, of course. So, it's, so our infrastructure is network rail, government run. Sure. Um, they have six point six billion pounds of revenue every year. They have forty two thousand employees. It's not an insignificant number of people. What is stopping us from managing those people? in a better way, like you say, working at night, working early in the morning, get this stuff done. This country just seems to be incredibly bad at managing people to just fix the stuff that needs fixing. This is a big problem because uh, the, the, the levels of productivity in transportation by European standards are very, very low. We haven't got the, the right attitude in terms of managerial ethos and work. Well, the work ethos is a huge problem. Mm. So until that's sorted out, this, this will not go away, but some of the problems this weekend are of our own making. They're not fundamentally infrastructural issues. They're just to do with bad planning. Yeah. But some, some aren't our fault, though. And we're talking about different things. And of course, like on the railway, of course, excessive union um, ability, power might be a factor. We certainly saw with Aslev and their ability to bring the country to a halt with their strikes, that they are a very powerful union. And if you're saying, well, suddenly I'm going to flex it and make you work at night, yeah. I dare say they'd have something to say. But on the other hand, with the airports, even though we've dropped our testing requirements and tracing requirements, the countries you're going to haven't. And that's not the fault of staff at airports in Britain. That's, yeah. the, that's the situation that... If I can just... Let's just have a look at some of the detail of, of how chaotic your, your travel might be. These are the cancellations. This, this one blew my mind. London Euston closed from Good Friday to Easter Monday. I mean, that is the yeah. biggest Good station... Good luck getting to Birmingham. ...in <laughs> London. Good luck getting to Manchester. You know, that is outrageous. Like, who thought that would be OK? Um, Waterloo, Marylebone, Aylesbury via Parkway trains will not be running. I should put on my best announcer voice here, shouldn't I? Waterloo, <laughs> Marylebone. Uh, no trains will run on the main Gatwick Express or Southern Route from London, Victoria. That's unbelievable. So just well. think about that. So yeah. if you're trying to get to the airport on the train, forget it. You're going to have to get a cab, which is going to block up the roads, which it's is going to worsen pollution. Downstead <laughs> Express trains not running with rail replacement buses running to Essex Airport. I mean... Do you think, I do wonder, though, given, given as, as um, well, I can't remember who it was now, but had said the fact that we haven't travelled an awful lot in the last mm. two years, should there have been a different attitude to the planning? Should the powers that be have said, look, everyone has been desperate to see their families for two years. Some of them, this will be the first time they've gone to visit the grandparents or the grandchildren. Let's give this Easter weekend, mm. let's give it, let's, let's, let's take the works out of this picture and kick them into the next few weeks. Well, I agree, it's a unsustainable and uh, yeah. this will uh, likely carry on through the summer and beyond but I've also heard travel experts displacing the blame on the travellers themselves saying they're almost <laughs> rediscovering how to travel for example at airports they forget to isolate liquids they forget that we're not allowed above 100 millimetres to take us with us. And We've been de-skilled. <laughs> Lockdown has de-skilled us. The process of going through customs and security, I think it's, uh, you know, the, a large part of the blame is due to infrastructure problems and indeed getting the right amount of staff to man all these jobs. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's definitely, a, there is a workforce problem as well, as, there is as, as you said. I mean, I, I, this last three weeks I've been in the Ukraine, I've been in Hungary, I've been in Italy and I've been in Austria, and I can tell you one thing. The, the infrastructure there is far superior. Even Hungary, little Hungary has got a better infrastructure. You go to the airport, and they just wave you through mm. in a way that it would be unthinkable here. So I think we have a, 
a workforce problem and we're just having the imagination to understand just how important it is for us. To well, that's because that's the word you used earlier, Alex, is we, there are imaginative ways that we can manage this situation. Who is lacking that imagination? Oh, so I don't think you don't have to be that imaginative to improve our system, <laughs> no. right? So it's a pretty low base. And I think it exists at every level of, of the um, scenario you're talking about. And as Frank was pointing out, I think, frankly, there is a work ethos problem. We're all told we, we must pretend that everyone who works in any kind of public service works really hard all the time, and you're a terrible person if you suggest otherwise. Actually, um, especially when it comes to some drivers and the tube, which I, you know, which I use all the time as a Londoner, is a great example of people who are paid very well to do not a great deal mm. and uh, and hold the capital to ransom pretty often mm. right so um, excessive unionization and curbing thereof is a lesson we learned in the 1980s and seems we need to relearn again so that's part one mm. part two is we do have a massive managerial class in all of these systems which and doesn't isn't just true of transport it's true of things like our health service too and even our, our law enforcement so that's the second and I suppose the third would be what Frank was talking about about being politically imaginative I don't know if the right thing to do is to nationalize peer know, but I know that I would encourage having discussions like that to try and get us out of the situations that we're in. Instead, Britain just seems very stoic. We just seem to say to ourselves, oh, well, yeah. I remember one, one summer the central line in London went down. I mean, if that happened in Paris, the yeah. government would fall. The hay bales would come out, there'd be protests all over the capital. Yeah. Instead, in England, we say, well, well, for I'm one day, sure we say, oh, well, <laughs> yeah, no, well, maybe not it'd be fixed, but God, people would pay attention yeah, exactly. to it. Instead, we just grumble and get on with it. And we have, we have for example, we have this blockade of oil depots. Now, it's not directly, but it's indirectly related to this. What does the government do? Mm. It basically tells the oil companies to get their act together, to do something. And this is holding the country to ransom. It basically means that an essential element of our infrastructure that, that kind of makes our mobility possible is thwarted. Mm. And I just cannot understand why people just, oh, yeah, this is interesting, this is happening. That's right. And, you know, turn the page. Should we, though, Nabila, should, should we all be accepting that, that the days of uh, kind of universal travel, being able to go around the world and, well, I mean, crikey, all I'm looking for is to get my teenage son from London to a water park in Surrey on Monday morning on the train. <laughs> I can't even do that. Like, but do we have to tr all accept that those days are gone? And we just, uh, there are so many people we need to apparently protect the planet that we can't we can't fly in the same way that we used to well we thought that the pandemic would have thought uh, taught us that but apparently you know old habits die hard and the moment good we, uh, <laughs> yeah. the moment good. we get our good. freedom uh, back we we're back on the road and we're back in the air and we're back on trains so i think it's a part of humanity to be yeah. curious to move around to go places um having said that my own view is that we have to learn to be more reasonable about mm. moving around not least of all for uh, reasons linked to e ecology and preserving the planet but, uh, you know, they, they are, you can look at it on, on either side of the argument. You know, some people think that it's a wonderful thing, that travel has, no, is, uh, immensely, has immensely democratised and an awful lot of people can travel on a low budget and dif uh, discover different parts of the world. But the other side of the argument is we might have to be a bit more reasonable about that and think yeah. about the long-term future of the planet. It's, it's an important part of being a human being, isn't it, Absolutely. Frank? Absolutely. It's our humanity. To see the world. The, the quest for freedom is, is linked to this idea of being mobile and, and finding yourself through the journeys that you undertake. Mm -hmm. On Nabila's point about the cheapness, uh, that might have been the case in the past. If you look at the, the rail fares, for example, in, in England, they are at an all-time high. They, I mean, they're going way above inflation rates. The airlines have really almost doubled many of their fares since the pandemic, so it's no longer the case that you're getting these cheap deals. So travel has become very, very expensive, not only very difficult, but very, very expensive mm. for a lot of people. Mm. Alex, you, you, I, mean, I must say, boys, you look like you've got a bit of a tan today. Have you been sat in the garden? But yes. Yes, I thought you had. Not so Frank's garden, can... my own, but so... yes. <laughs> no, no. We're not that close yet. <laughs> no, not that Give it time. Give it time. Um, but I just think, is, is, that why, is that one of the reasons, do you think, as, as people who live here in Great Britain, we're not going to complain this weekend no. because no. the sun is out. Great weather. It makes everything yeah. better. It does. But we should be angry, that's, Frank. That's the, reason hey, the first, are, are. that's the reason the first lockdown went so well for everyone yeah. trying to enforce yeah. it. We had really nice weather. Oh, we're fickle and very, yes. very shallow, aren't we? Absolutely. Uh, do keep your socials coming to me um, on Twitter at uh, GB News or at Beverly Turner. You can email as well, GB Views at uh, GB News. Um, so where next for you, Frank? If you could go anywhere, you can fly anywhere, where do you go? 
I usually go to Italy, but I went skiing last month, which was the high point of my life in the last two and a half years. And what I'd like to do is, you know, as long as I live, I want to go skiing at least once a year. Yeah. And that, that's the bus for me, the kind of, you know, the white snow, the sun, the blue skies, the total experience. And if I was ever deprived of that, I'd be even a crutchier person than I'm now. Mm. It would just completely finish me off. OK. All right. OK. Well, I hope you get out of your uh, traffic jams wherever you are. As I say, do, do let us know how it's going for you. Do you share our frustrations um, at the fact that on a bank holiday weekend, everything just seems to come to a halt? OK, uh, Tesla boss Elon Musk has put in a $41 billion offer to take over Twitter to keep it a platform of free speech. But he's now worried it might not be successful. More on that next. <laughs> Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. And we're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Bev Turner, here until seven. My panel this evening, PR consultant Alex Dean, author and academic Frank Faridi, journalist and broadcaster Nabila Ramdani. Now, I asked you to send in uh, your socials about the travel situation. You have done just that. Don has said, we've driven down from Manchester to Dorset, towing our caravan. We didn't have any problems whatsoever. All right, don't rub it in, Dan. Uh, but that might be because we drove down on Wednesday. OK, that doesn't count. <laughs> that doesn't count. Uh, <laughs> no, it's just cheating. Uh, Phil says, Bev, I can't believe I'm I'm hearing this. Don't go anywhere. It happens every bank holiday. No sympathy from me. Phil, if you're working all week, you've got your long weekend, you need that. Where is your sympathy? We can't just give up. And Pauline has said, what about us people whose lives are being sacrificed for travel? My Kent coastal hometown is a nightmare. Well, you live in Kent. You, you, I think what Pauline's getting at is that uh, lots of out-of-towners yeah. moving in is ruining, ruining it for them. But you get to live in Kent all the time. So again, I have no sympathy. Uh, right, moving on. Love it or loathe it, Twitter has, in the words of Tesla boss Elon Musk, become the de facto town square. But, he says, it fails to adhere to the free speech principles, undermine, and thereby undermining democracy. Uh, Musk, the world's richest man, is followed by 82 million people on Twitter. So when he speaks, many listen. Now, frustrated by the world's most popular social media platform's increasingly censorious attitude, they're <coughs> blocking accounts and adding misinformation labels willy-nilly, Musk is attempting to buy Twitter for $41 billion. The social media company is considering the bid, but the CEO Parag Agrawal has told staff that Twitter will not be held 
hostage by the offer. Uh, let's come to you first, Alex. Why does this matter? Uh, it matters because Twitter is where uh, millions of people get their news and it has become a forum in which people exercise their speech hopefully free, and I think probably best characterised as free-ish. Um, what you were setting out in your introduction, I think, is right. Increasing numbers of accounts have been blocked, frozen for 28 days and so forth. And I'm afraid my suspicion is a large number of them tend to be politically on the right. Mm. Uh, people on the, on the left have, have, have answered that, have looked at that and, and answered it by saying, well, Twitter's a private company, it can do what it likes. I look forward to them cleaving to that point of view when it's owned by Elon Musk. Well, I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure that left and right exists anymore after the last two years that we've had. I think that, to some extent, is a bit outdated. You yeah. are either uh, pro, pro libertarian, you are a, a freedom believer in freedom or you, and the rights of the individual, or, or you are not, I would argue. Frank? I, I agree with you. And, and the tragedy is, is that those people who are the real free spirits and who kind of uh, have, have opinions which go against the grain are often marginalized by Twitter. And very often, you know, sort of people who read my articles tell me that Twitter tells them that this article is, you know, not dangerous, but they got a particular Disputed. expression. That's yeah. right, expression that they use. So there is a, a, a speech issue here. And it's, and, and, you know, sort of Alex is absolutely right. Although it's a private company, it's a public infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, the, that's the tragedy. The trouble is, is that even though Musk says that he believes in free speech, it's not going to change anything because aside from Twitter, we have governments like our own who are passing new laws all the time, which basically try to regulate Twitter. And, and now, for example, they got, they got this new law coming through. The online harm safety Online, bill. exactly, mm -hmm. which is going to make things even worse. And this is a conservative government that's bringing that And in. when you say even worse, just to clarify, what that means actually is that social media will be regulated in the way that the mainstream media. It, it is, yeah. and, and, and there's this impulse on the part of public authorities to try to please everybody and not to be too offensive. And they forget the fact that any idea that's a serious good idea will offend somebody. Okay. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a good idea. The freedom of speech with... has to include the freedom to offend. Otherwise, it's not free at all. You can't just be... You can't, only, if free speech is only things you like, then there's no real meaningful free speech at all. Nabila, I don't know whether... Are you busy on Twitter? Are you a busy twi Twitterer? Relatively busy, yeah. yeah. I, I use it a lot as a journalist. What do you use it for? Well, mainly to um, uh, interact with colleagues, uh, follow the news and um, uh, post my uh, own uh, journalistic work. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Do you think it's a force for good? And do we need it to be uh, entirely free from censorship in order to do what it is meant to do? Well, I think, generally speaking, it, it's a very good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but, you know, uh, my own view on freedom of expression is very basic. I think there should be no censorship uh, of any words that are not illegal and which indeed respect provable facts. Uh, and that's the bottom line, you know, facts and truth. Mm. And, and people often forget that public decency and, and indeed the freedom not to be abused are actually firmly protected by a raft of legislation. So, for example, if you abuse somebody, uh, uh, then you are um, committing a criminal offence and you are likely, and rightly, uh, likely to end up being uh, convicted. Mm. Now, this won't change, no matter who is in charge of social media. Yeah. Uh, and, yes, you can argue that it's very difficult to report someone, or indeed prosecute someone, but this is no different to anything else. And I think the principle that we have to bear in mind is that illegal activity is not allowed and there's no need for special restrictions when it comes to, uh, to, to apply that to freedom of speech. And similarly, I think one of the problems we, we, we're having, and we will always have, in, in establishing what are alleged facts, uh, what uh, alleged facts are true, and indeed which ones are being made up. But I think in, in that area, we also have to use uh, our common sense and be sens sensible about all these yeah. cases. If, you know, there's a pattern of someone who is a provable liar, then you can in, in, <laughs> imply that, uh, you know, it will be hard, this person will be hard to be taken seriously. Well, we, we thank you. We've, um, we've had a Twitter poll running with our uh, GB <coughs> News uh, viewers, which we can have a look at. And we asked, um, as the report suggests, as reports suggest, Elon Musk is going to buy Twitter to protect free speech. So we have... A Asked, does the platform allow free speech? Uh, I don't have the results at the moment. I don't think looking at it, that is our... OK, 88% of you say no. The platform does not 
allow free speech. 88% of you. So that really does beg the question, how, how many of us would have to think it doesn't exist for it to to just for us to fail to engage with it because we are engaging on it i'm on it a lot mm -hmm. and i know that you have to be careful you i do. don't want to be careful but we're still using it even we, though the majority of us feel that we are being censored in some way yeah. well, we have no choice because uh, unfortunately we haven't got a platform like uh, like twitter and twitter is is really quite important because anybody who's anybody that matters is is on it uh, I'm a free speech absolutist. Mm. I don't accept the fact that, for example, uh, we're in a position to decide what is true and what isn't. Exactly. I, I know what is true, but very often, you know, I've heard people say what I think is true to be denounced for pro promoting uh, fake news. And I would so still allow that, though, because I, I, I know, you've got to allow I that. think that I know what is true, but so other people have different perspectives. And if we give up to the platform the ability to decide what facts are, then effectively we allow them to censor uh, what people say in a sense of disagreement, effectively, yeah. and, they, and, and, and say there is one form of truth and it is theirs. But we also empower in, uh, those people to basically police new ideas, because when new ideas come up, people always think that they're wrong, yeah. and it's only through free debate and, and free discussion that they flourish. And it's only now that we discover that all these fake news about, for example, the pandemic mm. is now actually seen as the truth, mm. you know, sort of a year after the event. So we have a situation where we were told that China is exemplary in the way they handle the pandemic. You know, we've we got to learn from China. You look at the situation in Shanghai today, it's and horrendous. all of a sudden it Boy. becomes very, very clear that, you know, that was just fake. They were the ones with the fake news, not yeah. our side. Well, the, I mean, obviously the pandemic has, this is, this is what I think has made us, a lot of us, aware. And maybe, maybe it was ever thus. Maybe Twitter was always more of a political um, setting than we may have realised. But just to give you an idea of some of the, this is from uh, Twitter's own, own pages, where they, they say, we'll apply labels to tweets. So this is a label, basically, to say that this is misinformation. And you get one strike in accordance with the strike policy, and I think a couple, and then you get a ban. Um, but it says, false, false or misleading information about preventative measures one can take to avoid infection, such as claims that face masks cause uh, bacterial pneumonia or do not work to reduce transmission. Now, there's a whole host of them that they use in relation to COVID, mm. which are scientifically debatable. Mm. And so when they are saying, well, this is, this is fact, yeah. that's science denying, is it not, Nabella, when it's talking about the pandemic and COVID? I mean, they're saying, this is what we will take you down for. That's propaganda. Well, I think we have to look at situations uh, uh, as they come up and deal with them accordingly. But I think... Most of the time, if some people want to make themselves look stupid, at least we can call them out. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think uh, um, what bothers me about social media is the really nasty stuff when you start breaching the law. And I think one solution to, to deal with that potentially is to insist that every user has to reveal their identity and, in, and, and, and why not, in some cases, linked their account to a credit card number. Oh, no, I would uh, disagree with that. I would so that would allow, that. let me carry on yeah. with my argument, that would, could even allow suspensions and even fines if, you know, um, we, you know we come across really bad behaviour. Mm. And I think, generally speaking, uh, Twitter users are very good at regulating each other. But you see, saying that masks work would be considered, cons or saying that masks don't Work, sorry, would be considered really bad behavior by Twitter, and that could get you taken off. Whereas I can find you thousands of doctors. Uh, I don't approve of anybody being true. taken off. You know, there have yeah. been discussions about you know Trump being taken off Twitter. Yeah. Uh, why are the Taliban on Twitter, for example? Why is Putin on Twitter, for example? I think you know, uh, in the end, you know, you have to call out those people and interact with them. You know, it's uh, like in life, you have to deal with people you disagree with. Yeah. As long as you you you, you respect the law. Yeah. You know, the only thing that you, you can censor legitimately is incitement to violence. Yes. I yeah. think that's something where we draw the line. But anything else, I think, is open game. That's what free exchange of views is really all about. Yeah, absolutely. OK, well, we are carrying on to freely exchange uh, our views here. And uh, do keep getting in touch with us on Twitter at GB News. OK, coming up, closed store. Monsoon says that it's female changing rooms are open to both sexes, grr. After a complaint from a customer, we're going to ask the panel what they think about that.
where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday night feast on GB News, 7 p.m. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday night feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9 p.m. on GB News. Be there. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Jubes and Co. Thank you for listening on your DAB radio, for watching on your telly, on YouTube, and also on the app. Now here with me until seven, my panel, PR consultant Alex Dean, author and academic Frank Faridi, journalist and broadcaster Nabila Ramdani. Okay, the clothes store Monsoon has said that its female changing rooms are open to both sexes after teenager Charlie Moore, uh, who identifies as non-binary, was left humiliated when they were blocked from the women's fitting room to try on a prom dress. Monsoon later apologised, saying that its changing rooms are open and available to all customers. And the incident comes after the Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission said it is perfectly legal for public bodies and businesses to limit services to a single sex. So let's have a look at this story. So. Charlie is 18. Now, we wouldn't know about this story if Charlie hadn't gone on Twitter and said, Hi, Monsoon, UK. Just been into your Birmingham store to try on a couple of prom dresses, but was told I wasn't allowed to because of my gender assigned at birth. Could you confirm if this is the company policy? Thank you. Now, of course, this the UK being the UK. Uh, some eagle-eyed uh, journalist <laughs> <laughs> saw that and thought, oh, this is good, and uh, have basically written about it. And, and Monsoon were, had apologised and they gave Charlie some free dresses for the perfect uh, prom dress that they would need. But this raises, I think, I think, a very, very important debate, a really important issue about safe spaces for mm. females. It is not just about whether you should be able to try on a dress without somebody seeing your bottom through the curtain of a changing room, although that is obviously important to us. But it is about having safe spaces for women that are not compromised because one individual makes a bit of a fuss. Mm. Nabala, come, coming to you, um, 
Is that, a, am I summing that up in a little bit of a simplistic way or do you agree with me? Well, I think it's simplistic but fair. Yeah. I mean, it's all about safe spaces in the end and safe spaces for everybody. And uh, the uh, UK's uh, equality body has actually reacted to this story and they have said that Munson were in fact within their rights to remove Charlie uh, from the changing room following complaints from uh, um, women and idiot children, uh, but only as long as a gender neutral changing room was also provided for uh, transgender people and indeed non-binary pe people. So the, um, co the Equality Commission's guidelines to limit um, services to single sex people uh, comes with the caveat if the reasons are justifiable and indeed uh, uh, proportionate, while in this case it seems, seems reasonable to assume that they were all that mm. because they were complaints by women and indeed children. And I think they should, you know, we should move the debate to uh, allowing specific spaces for transgender people, non-binary people, not just in services uh, uh, as in this case, but also the debate is expanding to a whole uh, host of areas in society, mm. including uh, transgender people being allowed to compete with women in sports, but also to use facilities such as uh, changing room hospitals, prison services uh, and, and the like, uh, shelters, uh, you name it. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the law should protect individuals individuals uh, such as these women and their children in this uh, case of this uh, uh, story to assert their right in relation to issue, issues such as privacy, decency and, and indeed the right to prevent trauma and, and in, in one very uh, fair way in my view to look at it is one individual's liberty stop when they encroach on other people's mm. uh, freedoms. Well, I, I can promise your listeners that when I try on my prom dress I'm going to do it in a, a, in a male changing room. <laughs> and I will not encroach yeah. on anybody else. I, I think the very fact that we're having this discussion indicates how messed up uh, British culture has become. Mm. Uh, we're getting to the point now where we're kind of trying to reorganize our life around the attempt by a very small number of people to play around with their identity. So we have to annihilate our own identity mm. and subordinate who we are in order to make some other people comfortable, whereas there's a very sensible solution to this. You know, let transgender uh, people who believe in, in gender neutrality have their own changing room, you know, so they can hang out with each other, but allow women to be only with women, biological women, and men to be only with biological men. It's a very kind of obvious point to me, but the, the issue at stake is that from their point of view, that's no good. Mm. They want to impose their culture on us, so they want to they be with a woman you know, biological woman, because that way they can demonstrate that they are the same as far as the identity is concerned. Well, it's really complicated, this, isn't it? Because, of course, no. if, you are, if you are a transgender person who has transitioned from male to female, you are presumably happy to use and, and wish to use the female facilities, be that a changing room, a toilet, a prison, a hospital, whatever. If you are female, transitioned to male, you want to use the male facilities. This person, Charlie, is a non-binary person. So are we saying that we have to also provide yeah. facilities for people who don't fit into either category? I kind of think, no. Mm. Alex? Well, since the dawn of recorded time, women have fought for equality with men. And as we live through the first sort of two, three generations at most, which it might even be argued that that's been realised, we now have a clutch of, and it mostly is men, uh, claiming to be female and saying, now I get to come into the female space that you've won. Yeah. I mean, I can't f think of a better example of the patriarchy in action, right? And yet it's, it's only old-fashioned conservatives who seem to be on the side of feminists and saying you're entitled to be a woman and have a safe space. It seems to me that, especially in these examples, we run the risk of letting a vanishingly small but very loud group of people who've bizarrely demanded the uh, defence of, of feminists to be on their side when their actions are profoundly anti-feminist, not just to distort society, as Frank was setting out, but basically make a farce of women's sports, yeah. um, embarrass... I mean, I always feel sorry for businesses like the ones that have just been picked out. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, ter terribly they sorry can't for the win from drag a of the public eye. I mean, they apologise because yeah. that seemed like it was the right... I just, it do. makes a mockery of a whole series of things, and, they, and we are supposed to pretend that black is white and that up is down. There has to come a time when we say, stop, if you've got a penis, you're not a woman. <laughs> <laughs> And that's yeah. the bottom well, I'll drink to that. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and on that bombshell, no. But, I mean, I think the thing is, that, as, a, as I say, this particular individual, Charlie, I, we, we do not know what his... Uh, what, no, he says he was a 
This is this is why it's complicated, right? Does he say that he was born a Met? I think he was born a Oh, uh, friend, another, oh, there was two of them, Ch Charlie and his mate. Uh, his <laughs> friend does not identify as female, but, pre okay, I've got it now. Because his friend presents in a more feminine way, even though he is also non-binary. It's very complicated, isn't it? Yeah. And so, I guess what we're saying is we're in a period of transition, are we not? Where we would all agree it is wonderful that we are not living in a homophobic world anymore. Of course. That people are free to choose and uh, to dress as they like, whether that's mm -hmm. in a monsoon changing room or in the privacy of their own home, that they should be free to do that. But we are at risk of making such huge cultural shifts and that those will be at the expense of women, as Alex has just said, aren't they? Because I can't think of many instances in this debate which are at the expense of men. But you, you put your finger on where the problem lies, I think, because now we are talking about uh, these issues involving huge societal shifts. And that's where it's not an ish issue. It's not something that's, uh, you know, uh, irrelevant. It's becoming very much to the fore. And that's why it, there is, it's crucial that the legislator steps in. Mm. You know, the legislator only comes in when uh, a prob there's a substantial problem. And I think it's becoming one because on the one hand, you've got a group with legitimate, uh, uh, you know, uh, legitimate um, uh, agenda, wanting to exist, wanting to have a safe space in society, and nobody would want to deny them that space. But on the other hand, there's another group of people who feel threatened. So we have to get the legislator to come in and legislate in a fair manner so so that everybody feels comfortable, uh, uh, in, uh, protected, and indeed included. Yeah, but we, when we have laws coming in, we always uh, tend to make things worse because the minute you have new rules and laws on interpersonal relationship, we heighten the tensions and the conflict. And the experience shows the last 20 years is that laws don't create a nice, normal, harmonious situation. What laws create is the demand for even more laws. Well, they put boundaries, at least, and well, especially in institutions such as schools, hospitals, which are government-run yeah, institutions. But the boundaries were already there. The you know, when I was a young man, I would see there's a toilet with a man on it. I would know that's a male toilet. There would be a toilet with a woman on it, a woman toilet. Now all that we need to do is to make sure that we have uh, some gender-neutral uh, sort of toilets made available. And, and then the, the problem solved. Well, you would hope that common sense would prevail, but in some situations, it's not the case. Yeah. But in part because people are positively out to have the problem. People are out to provoke the issue. They're actually, I mean, I don't know about this individual's example, and put that to one side. My point is that some people will go out of their way to be told they can't do something. It's like men who've tried to go and have a wax and be told, well, sorry, we only do women. At which point, this big, hairy, bearded bloke says, you're discriminating against me because you won't wax my nether regions. I mean, it's, it's, it, you are deliberately trying to provoke the situation and then call the other person bigoted. It's quite wrong. But I think there's some... It's quite... To, to go to get a back sack and crack, if we, this is what we're getting at here, Alex, isn't it? I think that's quite different. I think they would have a point to say, you should, you, you should be able to treat me to give me the beauty therapy well, that I need. Well, apparently not. So apparently this, this poor woman recently who, who was asked to go and give a bloke a Brazilian said, well, <laughs> I can't because you don't have the requisite equipment. Oh, I see. And I, exactly. And so you meant that put the therapist in a vulnerable it the position. It puts the therapist in a room mm, with a yeah. person with a penis who's saying, I want, a, I want a Brazilian. And I would think in that situation, though, the relationship exists uh, between a beauty therapist and their, and their client. It, it should clearly be obvious that whether that beauty therapist is prepared to treat that man's exactly. nether regions with the wax or not. But I think that, that is sort of easily fixable, right? You say, that is not what I do. This, these are my personal boundaries. But what's happening in these debates is it's the boundaries are being changed for all of us. And as a mother of two daughters, I particularly worry about toilets becoming joint spaces because um, as women fought to have a space where we could... The public toilets allowed us to go out into the world. It's crazy we, to think that there was a time when there were no public yes, toilets for yeah. women. That bought us our liberty. And actually, there was a time where, for me growing up that if a man walked into a women's toilet, you knew he was up to no good. It was mm. the safe space you could go to. If you're on a night out, you felt threatened, yeah. you could go in the women's toilets. My daughters are very much at risk of never having that. And that worries me, but and also... people will claim that's progress. Yeah. And it's not progress, mm. no. because it also renders young men vulnerable. Because yeah. if a teenage boy goes into the mixed toilets and yeah. can be accused of something he hasn't done, well, no-one else was there and we were in the toilets. But you also, know? especially young girls, it confuses them. Because when that boy dressed up as a girl comes into the toilet, he's saying, 
that I'm just like you are. And you better believe it, you better accept it. And that confuses people's identity when they're very, very young. And actually, you're, you're so right, Frank. And, it, and it's about, you've been getting in touch with us on, on socials. I'm going to come to those in just a moment. Thank you. Um, but it's about understanding um, the difference as well, actually, critically, between children and adults. Exactly. Because when I took my young children to the swimming pool just for a swim when they were little, there became a point when it was inappropriate to have my son in the girls' toilets and that's a kind of right of changing rooms that's a right yeah. of passage isn't it well you you need to go in there with daddy now because you're too old to be in here with the girls and that i mean i know that there'll be people watching this going but you are so old-fashioned bev you are so <laughs> outdated <clears throat> that is an important lesson for both genders to learn it's it's the essential foundation of child development yeah the first distinction they make is between the two genders and if that boundary becomes confused as it is now it's going to mess up a whole generation of young kids. That's what I'm worried about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do we fix this, eh? Right, what have you been saying? Uh, monsoon changing rooms. Deirdre has said female changing rooms should only be for the use of biological females. End of. Uh, Peter says if, if Charlie tried to enter the female dressing rooms while my niece was in there uh, trying on her prom dress, I would ask him to wait until she had left. If he insisted on entering, I would physically prevent him. This is the problem, is it causes genuine conflicts and arguments, probably where there doesn't need to be any, but mm -hmm. somehow we have to all live together. Barbara says, uh, can't he go into the men's and try on dresses there? What actually is the difference? Well, uh, the trouble is Monsoon is a women's shop. That's why there was no male changing rooms. And Sandra has said uh, making separate changing rooms for trans women. Um, I'm not sure that separate, entirely separate entities work. Do they, Nabella? Well, I think they do. I mean, if everybody feels safe in the end and not excluded, then I think that's the way forward. You see, I, I, this again, this is a lot of people are going to say this is a, that's a terrible thing to say, but I have heard the suggestion that actually the disabled toilets, which we quite rightly should have yeah. for people to use. And I often wondered if you, if you are in a wheelchair, how you must be so frustrated by this conversation because it took a very, very long time to provide disability yes. toilets. Mm. And a lot of buildings still don't get that right. And yet, a very noisy minority come along and say, but I want, I want a space for me. And we are going to, it looks like we're going to accommodate it if we're not careful. Yes, and, and, and I think it, it's turning into the tyranny of the minority in a way. Yeah. Um, now, we don't want to stigmatize any group. Um, you know, they're perfectly entitled to feel part and parcel of society, comfortable in their bodies, comfortable in their workplace and, and the rest of it. But, and there's a big but, which is a caveat of the vast majority of other people who have equal rights. Yeah. Mm. Tyranny of the minority. Yeah. Thing. I mean, also, I don't want my children or anybody else's children being confused because a small number of people decide that they want to play with their identity because they will mess up their identity. And that, to me, is the crucial issue. That's much more important than anybody's individual needs. We're talking about a whole generation of young people mm. who are growing up disoriented and confused. Yeah, well, not if they watch GB News, right? We will, <laughs> we will keep your feet on the ground. We will keep your teenagers uh, clarified and everything they need to know. Right, thank you, uh, panel. If you missed any of today's show, you want to catch up on the episode, you can download it wherever you get your podcasts, etc. I'll be back on Monday. Have a lovely weekend. Looking ahead to this afternoon, and the UK is looking dry for many with some sunshine, but cloudier in the west. Let's take a look at the details. Skies are likely to be cloudy across parts of Devon and Cornwall this afternoon, with some drizzle and sea fog in the west. Further east, it'll be brighter with some warm sunny spells. The brightness extends into southeast England, where there'll be plenty of sunny spells this afternoon, feeling warm in the sunshine with a high of 23 Celsius in London.